also taking pictures. <laughs> but anyway, um, yeah, so welcome. Thank you so much for coming today. We are very, very excited to have you. Um, just a show of hands, uh, uh, who has not attended any of our talks or workshops before? Wow, so okay. Um, welcome, thank you so much for coming today. Um, it's always good to see new faces and for us to meet new people as well. So if you are, I see a lot of, um, today I, I talked to a couple of you and I'm very, very surprised that you find a lot of you are working as software engineers at the company. And I really love that, uh, I really love to hear that there are a lot of women actually in How do you know is your If you are interested in no talk in the future, okay. we are always happy to have you. Um, so come and tell, 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 tell us what you're doing, we want to know you better. And yeah. So um, before Anna starts, I'd just like to say a big, very, very big thank you to our venue sponsor. Who, uh, so Lawrence over there is from PayPal. Everybody give Lawrence a big round of applause. <laughs> so um, Lawrence is from PayPal and PayPal has offered to sponsor the venue, the pizza, the drinks. So uh, the drinks machine behind, I think you can yeah, just Yeah, some press. stuff is running out, but I just press. I don't put yeah. money in there, I don't know where it goes to. <laughs> <laughs> so unless you want to add to Lawrence's salary, I think. No, it doesn't go to my pocket. It doesn't go to my pocket. So, okay. Um, and also um, to the lovely people down here, they are from engineers.sg and they'll be recording the talk so that so if you are interested to find out a little bit more about what the tech community is up to in Singapore, you can just go to engineers.sg and all the most of the talks that oh, uh, most of the meetups that are happening, the talks are have, uh, recorded and put up there. Yeah. So today we are very very excited because we have Anna. Anna is um, the co-organizer of the Ruby Meetup in Singapore. Um, how many of you code in Ruby? She's also a current PhD uh, candidate at NUS, National University of Singapore. Her work is very much related to open source uh, communities and technology. So I will let her talk a little bit more about her personal journey in the world of tech and uh, her work as well. So if you can, please give me a big round. Of, please give and a big round of applause. <laughs> I was just curious, um, show of hands, how many of you are software developers? Very nice. I saw it. <laughs> okay. Um, how many of you are not software developers, but are interested to learn how to code, or have already started learning how to code? Basically the rest. Okay, awesome. Um, so, as Joy said, I'm a PhD candidate at NUS, the National University of Singapore, and I study open source software development from the point of view of uh, organizational dynamics. So I'm interested in how people work together in such big collectives, across such big instances, what makes that dynamic tick, and uh, that is uh, something I've been working on for the last few years. Um, I'm also involved in the Ruby group, uh, as Joyce mentioned as well, and we're meeting next week on Tuesday, if you want to those of you who are Rubyists, and even if you're not, please do come and join us. Uh, we're always happy to see new people. Uh, what else can I tell you about me? Um, if you want to get in touch with me, uh, Twitter and uh, my website. I've been working on this for the last four years, but um, in total, open source has been my life for as long as I remember. So everything I know from computers, I know from open source. And, uh, one of the reasons that I started a PhD uh, studying open source software is because I wanted to give something back to me. I wanted to go in with the knowledge that this is how I can help. And um, what I'm going to do today is um, I'm going to try to cater to a couple of different interests. So I wasn't sure what my audience is going to be like exactly. So there's going to be a little bit of background. There's also going to be a little bit about uh, what I'm interested in, and there's going to be a little bit about how I can get more involved. Okay? And it's generally organized into um, a couple of myths that I think people have about open source software development, um, and I'm going to go through one of them, uh, each one of them at a time. Uh, but before that, um, of those who are software developers, how many of you contribute to open source software? Okay, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Okay. How many of you use open source software on a daily basis? Okay, keep your hands up, keep your hands up, don't put them down. Okay, how many of you use VLC? 
okay, keep your hand up. How many of you use uh, Firefox? Uh, Chrome? Uh, Android? Okay, <laughs> you get the idea. All right, um, so all of these are open source projects. Um, and uh, in fact, if you go into programming languages, Ruby, Python, all of that, I think we're gonna cover the whole group. Okay, so this is something that's really relevant for all of us. Okay, so, Okay, it's just a little slow. Um, so these are the four myths that I wanted to talk about. So first, uh, the fact that free and open source software is a new idea. Uh, so we're going to debunk that myth. The second is that women don't participate. The third, that um, there aren't any gains to you personally or economically for contributing. This is something that people do with pure altruism. That's another myth we're going to talk about. And the last one that I'm really interested in uh, talking about is you need to be really good to get started. Okay? So, um, myth number one. Why is open source software not in the right So, I really like this picture. This is, um, this is open source software from the 1960s. These are tapes. Um, this is, for those of you who can't see at the back, uh, this is an octal debugging program. This is the ASCII source code and a three-word debugging package. Um, and these were used in really, really old computers. Um, these are produced by a group called Decus because um, in the 50s and in the 60s, when uh, people made hardware, software was distributed alongside that in order to facilitate its use, but it wasn't something that people sold or people felt the need to sell because people are in the business of making hardware and not software, right? And so a user group formed around that called Decus, and they used to distribute source code it tapes like this. So it would come in like a little nice package and you'd have uh, bits of tape slotted in. It was all really cool. Um, one of the first compilers, uh, the A2, so the A0, and then the A2 is a different version of that, was released as one of the first free software projects, and that was in the 1950s. Um, what they did was they released the source code for this compiler and they actually asked people for feedback. Um, so as early as the 1950s, people were releasing software as free. They didn't think about it as free software or open source software. They thought about it as just the way that people engage with software. Um, this is a couple guys at the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab, the AI Lab. And uh, this is perhaps the most famous group of people who were using open source software before it was before it was open source software. Um, uh, that is academics. So the academic principle of openness was sort of fundamentally built into how people shared software. Software was distributed on source code by default because um, you needed to modify it in order to work in the hardware. Um, it wasn't something that was already pre-built and there are so many different variations of hardware than there are now. In fact, we're kind of in, a, in an era where hardware is converging a little bit, so we don't have as much variability as we did like, way back then. So you had, to, you had to usually modify the source code in order to, to be able to get it to run on your machine. And so it was only natural that software was distributed as open source. Um, you would also find that folks would fix bugs um, in the software, and so it was really good to distribute it as open source because security systems were not existent. So you wanted to be able to see what was going on in the source code in order to be able to uh, fix the problem yourself. So you wouldn't necessarily trust that the binary that someone gave you would be secure enough. And also, people found it completely natural to collaborate together and add new functionality. Um, so no one really thought about it as free software, or no one really thought about it as a movement. It was just a game. It was this particular lab that uh, Richard Stallman joined in 1971. This is Richard Stallman. <laughs> uh, this is one of my favorite pictures. Um, this is the man who started the free software movement, and for him, it was um, it was a sort of a, a coalescence of factors. So in the 60s and 70s, software started to become a bit more complex and the production of software became decoupled from the production of hardware. Uh, because production costs were increasing, and so uh, folks started to see the economic value in actually selling software separately. And um, bundling software with your computer meant that there was a higher cost for the, uh, for the consumer in order to buy this. Consumers were not necessarily willing to buy the same software that came off the machine. In fact, uh, one of the first antitrust cases was in the uh, late 1960s, um, and uh, that also ruled that you shouldn't bundle software with your hardware because it's anti-competitive. And so that created an opportunity, a space, for people to develop software as a service, software as a product. And so software became um, much more commercial. 
The other thing that happened was the introduction of Unix. So uh, Unix became really popular, but Unix was not open. Unix was uh, initially distributed for free um, uh, to nonprofit organizations, to uh, educational institutions, but eventually that license changed. And so you had to pay for security updates through the late 70s and 80s, and people weren't really happy about that, because by then you had established a huge ecosystem, and uh, all the, the, the ecosystem that depended on these uh, patches were suddenly in a position that they had to pay to be able to operate. And for most people, the reality of using Unix was not practical in a financial sense. <clears throat> so all of this didn't sit very well with Solomon because um, he came from a tradition of uh, openness and sharing in the MIT AI lab. And so even when he left, um, he felt pretty frustrated. And he usually tells this, this one story of a Xerox machine. So he had a paper jam. And um, he uh, figured out that it was a systemic issue with the copying machine. And the copying machine was donated to the AI lab. So he thought, well, no problem. I'll just crack open the source code, see what's going on, see if I can fix it. Right? No big deal. Fortunately, that wasn't the case. So for the first time in his life, he came across a situation where he couldn't look into the source code or something. And so he started digging deeper. He went and contacted the manufacturer. The manufacturer said, well, actually, you need to talk to this guy at this university. He called the guy at the university, and the guy at the university said, you know what? He made me sign a non-disclosure agreement, so I can't give you the source code. And that's sort of when he went, ah, ah, okay, this is not good, because I can fix this. Not only can I fix this, I can help other people who have the same problem, but I'm not allowed to do this, okay? And um, so what he did was he set about creating a Unix-like system, um, a replacement for Unix that was going to be completely open, and that was going to have built within it the idea that if you're going to use it, you're going to have to contribute, you're going to have to keep whatever you have modified open. And so uh, that's how the GNU project came about. The GNU project was very successful, but it was missing one critical component, and that was the kernel. And that's when this guy comes in. <laughs> Everybody know who this, who this is, right? Uh, this is Linus Torvalds. Um, so um, in response to what was going on with Unix, um, Andrew Tenenbaum created Minix, uh, which was uh, for educational purposes. Um, he created that uh, alongside a book that he wrote on uh, uh, software um, and operating systems. And a lot of universities were using this as course material. The problem is that even though Minix was open and you could see the source code, you couldn't modify it and you couldn't redistribute it. So uh, Linus Torvalds had a brand new gadget at the time with some crazy specs and he couldn't run Minix on it. So what does he do? He says, you know what guys, I'm gonna roll my own. And because GNU still hadn't, had, uh, still hadn't come up with a kernel, that's essentially the part that he had to write. So he had to write a kernel. And um, he used uh, Stallman C compiler, so the GNU C compiler is still in use today in Linux. And uh, he also eventually switched to the GNU public license, and he said it's one of the best things he ever did for the project. Um, by the way, all of your Android phones, those of you who put up your hands, they all run Linux. Yeah? And so that's how this happened, right? So now whenever people say Linux and you're talking about the operating system, you're actually talking about GNU slash Linux, right? I'm not actually talking about Linux. So back to this guy. So the thing is, Linus Torvalds is just one man, right? Um, how do you manage a project that's growing bigger and bigger and bigger? You have all of these developers, you have all of these expectations, and by something like 1998, this was becoming a big problem. So people were contributing patches at a rate that he was not expecting. In fact, if you read his original email, he was not expecting this to grow beyond the architecture that he built it for. And within a few years, this was running on so many machines across different parts of the world, hundreds of people were contributing to this, and he was the gatekeeper. He was the person who had to read all these things, and he had to apply all the patches, and frankly, he had a job, he had a kid, he was kind of tired, right? So what does he do? Um, he, starts to, he starts to fall back a little bit, and uh, Linux almost forked at this point. Uh, this is a really interesting story. What happened was uh, one of the other core developers started to accept patches on his behalf because he said, okay, okay you know, I know Linus is busy. Let's create like a nightly build and I'm going to accept all these patches and you guys can use it so you guys can have all of these updates. Now, the problem with that, of course, is that you get two different versions of the kernel. You get the official version and you get the version with all of the patches. 
So very soon, that could have become a completely different version of Linux and you could have had a fork. And that's not really a good thing for the community. So a couple of folks stepped in, and one of them was Eric Raymond, and they said, you know what, guys, we have to do something about this. Otherwise, you're going to have a fork. You're going you're gonna to destabilize one of the critical components of this ecosystem. Um, so what they did was they switched to a version control system. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of BitKeeper. Some of you might. So BitKeeper was a proprietary version control system. It's kind of like Git, uh, but at the time, Git wasn't written yet. And BitKeeper was a project that um, Larry McAvoy had uh, created. So he jumped into the conversation. He said, why don't you guys use this? Okay, it's commercial software, but I'm going to give you guys, uh, I'm going to give you developers a license to be able to use the software for kernel development as long as you don't contribute to anything else like CVS uh, or any other uh, version control system. And they said, sure. And this worked pretty well for a few years until someone decided to reverse engineer BitKeeper. So of course, McAvoy got really pissed. And he pulls this license and he says, you know what, you guys can't use this anymore. And Linus Torvald sat down and he wrote Git, which is probably what you guys are all using today. Yeah? So that's how Git came about. And shortly after, and um, I think this was uh, 2002, and then in 2008, got GitHub. So GitHub isn't actually an open source software project, but it runs on a bunch of open source software projects. Right? It runs on Git, it runs on Ruby and Rails, um, and it also encourages you to use open source licenses to host your projects, especially if you're hosting them for free. Right? So in a nutshell, history of select history of the open source movement okay so this this stuff has been around for a while so we're talking the last 50 60 years right okay myth number two the fact that women don't participate in open source software um, statistically that's kind of true so the numbers are really low especially if you look at surveys um, but I wanted to highlight a couple of really great examples of women leaders because I think that it's worth talking about you've noticed back there that all of the people that I talked about were men right um, but uh, a lot of the, there are a lot of women who have shaped the way that the open source community is right now. And so I wanted to uh, spend some time to talk about them. So this lady on the left here, this is Denise Cooper. Um, Denise Cooper joined Sun way back in the day, so when Sun was still Sun, when Sun still existed. And uh, she joined as one of the first people to head open source in Sun. And uh, her mission at the time was to open source Java. So you know that Java is one of the only interpreted languages that's not open source still. Um, she failed. Um, she, she met with a lot of resistance. She failed. She didn't get to do this, and she threatened to quit. And so they said, no, 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 you can't quit. You can't quit. You have to come back. And so she comes back, and uh, she stays a few more years, and she becomes an instrumental person in getting OpenOffice open source and all of the other engagements that Sun has had. So she's one of the big reasons why Sun is, uh, was so involved with open source at the time. She's now at PayPal, by the way. She's the head of open source. This is Sarah Sharp. I don't know if you guys heard the name, but if you follow what's going on with the Linux kernel, you probably have. Sarah Sharp is the creator and uh, the former maintainer of the USB 3 library in the Linux kernel, uh, which is really, really cool. She's got 10 years of experience under her belt, and she's also involved in uh, FOSS Women Outreach, so Free and Open Source Software Women Outreach. It's a really cool lady. She's also the person who stood up to Linus Torvalds and said, hey, you're kind of not being very nice. So this was the girl. Lots of respect for her. This is Karen Sandler. Karen is also a contributor of about 10 years, so she spent a decade writing code for open source software development. She was also the general counsel at the um, Free, software, uh, Free Software Law Center. Um, so you know that the Free Software Foundation has grown over the last few years since Stallman started it. And now the Free Software Foundation has a law branch that helps open source software developers um, fight for their rights and the licenses that they have chosen. So fight for the right to uh, have their software recognized as free open source software. And she was one of the general counsel. She's also the executive director of the GNOME Foundation for quite a while. And now she's uh, involved in the GNOME Outreach Program for women. Then we have, this is Elizabeth Joseph. She is famous for her work from, uh, in Ubuntu. She's literally written the book on Ubuntu. And she's also involved in OpenStack. She's got about 12 years of experience under her belt. Um, she runs Ubuntu Women, for those of you who are interested to join. And finally, uh, this is Linda Lucas. So Linda is um, Linda's a Ruby developer. 
She is also one of the co-founders of Rails Girls, for those of you who, who, um, who know what that is, and I'll talk a bit more about Rails Girls later. Um, she also wrote a programming book for kids called Hello Ruby, and she was recognized in 2013 as a Ruby hero. Um, incidentally, she's going to be in Singapore this summer, so if you want to come and see her, um, the Red Dot Ruby conference is happening in June, and she's one of the key speakers. And maybe you, at some time, right? Okay, so myth number three. So that was the easy stuff, right? So I think most of you guys know this. Um, myth number three, the fact that free software development is completely altruistic. So, so far, all we've talked about is how all these people have an ideological mission to make software free and accessible, share it with everyone, you know, that information should be free. And you're probably wondering why there's so many people doing this out of the goodness of their hearts. And the truth is that they're not really. But yes, they are. But it's not just about that. So, um, okay. This is Econ's 101, right? Uh, supply and demand graph. So your, the economic value of a good depends on both how much supply you have and how much demand there is, right? So you don't charge people for air because there's enough supply to go around for now, even though there's a very high demand, right? Um, on the other hand, there are things that are in very short supply in Singapore, like water, right? And so prices are adjusted accordingly. Um, and so what are the main problems in providing a common resource for everyone to share and to be able to just share things with, with the rest of the world is this problem of scarcity, right? Because if you share something with other people, then you're taking a piece away from yourself. But what happens when you have a digital good? When you have a digital good, if I give you a piece of, if I give you a copy of the software, I don't lose the ability to use that software, but you gain the ability to use that software. And that's an interesting reversal of this dynamic because this means that the financial incentives change dramatically. So if, um, if resources were scarce, then free writing is a problem, right? Because if I'm giving stuff away and people are not giving back, then my resources would be depleted pretty quickly. If I had a piece of pie and I gave it away to everyone else, then everyone else doesn't give anything back to me, I end up being hungry. But if my piece of pie could be cloned, like you can clone a software, uh, a piece of software, then I get to keep my piece of pie and you get to have a piece of pie, right? So it doesn't matter whether you give anything back to me because you get to keep that piece of pie. Here's a more uh, realistic example. So this is an idea, um, this is sort of a post-scarcity movement. So now digital goods are all not scarce goods because the fact of reproducing it doesn't cost you anything except for that initial uh, cost of production. So if I have a program that I have written and it fixes a particular need, it fills a particular need that I have. If I keep it to myself, fine. Um, if I put it online and a million people download it and no one contributes, I'm in the same position, right? Pretty much. If I put it online, a million people, a million people download it, one person makes a change that I hadn't noticed. I win, right? So it's, um, it's basic economics. It doesn't take anything away from me but it gives me something in return. And so this is sort of the idea that Eric Raymond uh, wanted to emphasize. So Eric Raymond, if you remember, is the guy who, who stepped in and said, wait, 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 wait. Linus Torvalds does not scale very well. Yeah, so we need, uh, we need a version control system. We need something like Git. So they switched to Git, BitKeeper and then they switched to Git. So this is the guy who got that started. Eric Raymond is also the guy who started the open source software initiative. And so you know when you talk about open source software, there's free and open source software. So the free part belongs to Stallman, the open source part belongs to this guy. Um, and the reason that they're put together like that is because they have two very fundamentally different ideologies. So what Eric Raymond says is, you know what, people should have the right to sell software if that's what they want to do, that's fine. But the thing is, open source software is structurally and economically more sound than closed source software. So it's a very different principle. It's not a moral obligation to share software. It's a very practical economic one. It's simply better to do it that way. Okay? And so he founded the Open Source Software Initiative. And now this is the initiative that keeps track of all the open source software licenses. And there's um, tons of them um, uh, that are compliant with the sort of general idea. GPL is one of them. One of the things that he says is <laughs> obligatory kitten gif. <laughs> 
So one of the things he says is that given enough eyeballs, all bugs are going to look shallow. So if there are enough people looking at a problem, someone's going to be able to see that there's an issue. If there are enough people looking at a problem, someone's going to see that there's a security flaw. If there are enough people looking at a problem, someone's going to see, hey, why are you doing it this way? You should be doing it, you should be doing it another way. Um, and uh, Raymond calls this Linus's law, you know, Linus Torvalds. The other thing that happens is um, safety in numbers. So why wouldn't someone say, a company, come along and say, okay, you know what, you guys have done great work, you know, you've put together this beautiful piece of software, I'm going to take it, and I'm going to use it, and um, I'm going to stay within whatever license that you guys have uh, set up, but I'm not going to give anything back to the project. So I'm just going to take it and go, you would say, okay, that's fine, you know, that's your prerogative. But the thing is, that doesn't happen as often as you might think, and the reason for that is there's a very strong incentive for you not to split a project. There's a very strong incentive for you not to fork a project. And the reason is that the more people you have contributing to something, the better. So imagine this. If you are uh, contributing to a project with lots and lots of people, then you're getting patches uh, all the time, you're getting updates. And if you fork that project, then you are the one who has to maintain that project. You are the one who has to do all of those updates. You are the one who has to figure out how to grow this project and move it forward, right? So normally you would only do that if you have enough support within the community. You would only do that if you are sure enough that there's going to be people behind you. So for a company, maybe that makes sense some of the time, but a lot of the time what makes more sense is to say, hey, you know what, we're going to use this, we're going to make changes when we find stuff, and we're going to send those changes back to you so that you can integrate it into your code and we can stay up to date on your version because that makes more economic sense. Yeah? And finally, um, all of these things together actually make a bigger whole. So um, the fact that the environment is transparent, the fact that everyone can see what's going on, the fact that there's open access, the fact that there are open licenses that make sure that people continue to have open access to source code, and the fact that people are sort of more or less self-interested, um, what that creates is a, an economy where people are sort of doing things for themselves, but it's contributing to a much bigger picture, right? Um, what do I mean by doing things for themselves? So sure, there are people who contribute to open source software because it's a good and moral thing to do. It's a way to share things with the world. But in general, there are a lot of personal reasons why this might be interesting. Um, a lot of people contribute to open source software because they want to learn something. So um, if I want to learn how to, if I want to learn a new language, if I want to learn how to build something, um, a lot of people contribute because they want a sense of community or they want people to feed into what they're working on because like I said more people working on a problem is better right so you want to share it with the world so that someone that one person out of a million can come in and say hey you know what you, you missed something so that's good for me too and finally a lot of people contribute because it's really good for your work it's really good for you professionally so imagine this you're a software developer you contribute to an open source software project what does that tell your employer or a potential employer? It tells them, A, that you are of a technical level that is good enough to be able to contribute to an open source software project. You can jump in, you can figure out a code base, and you are critical enough to know that there is an issue and you can fix it, right? That's sort of like interview step one, or maybe even interview step two, right? Um, and if you can demonstrate that, say in a GitHub profile, or in some other way in a prominent project, that's basically your CV, right? So for a lot of people, this isn't just a pastime. For a lot of people, this is a way of life. This is an engagement. This is something that really grows you as a person. This helps you to learn, but it also helps you financially and in your career. And finally, the last myth, that you must be really, really good to get started. Um, this is not true. Everyone is always learning in the ecosystem. So there are lots of different ways that you can contribute. Um, it's true that if you want to jump in and make a change to Firefox, that probably might take a while to figure out. But there are other things that you can do. Um, at this point, I guess I can tell you a little story of my own. So I told you guys that I've been working with, within this sphere for about 10 years. And um, when I got my first Linux CD, I knew nothing about computers. 
So I, I literally had someone hold my hand and walk me to the computer store and say, okay, she needs this, 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 and without an operating system. And he hands me an Ubuntu CD and goes, nah, have fun, okay? Um, and so what started, uh, what started me off was this combination of having to use an open system that I've never learned before. The fact that the system was open meant that I could figure out whatever I needed to. So all the documentation was there. Everything was open. I could literally look under the hood of something and say, hey, okay, this is how it works. So I started looking at WordPress uh, because I started a blog and I found myself tweaking the template of the blog a lot more than I was blogging in it. So I started building websites and then I started looking at how servers are built and then I started looking at how my operating system was built and it sort of spiraled from there. Yeah? And all of that is possible because all of these projects were open. Because WordPress allowed me to look under the hood and say, oh, this is how this is built. Because my open source operating system allowed me to look under the hood and modify things and say, hey, look, this is how it works. Hey, let me change it. So I've learned about every step of the uh, software development from just looking at open source software. It's, it's a fantastic tool. So if you want to get started, um, I'd say start subscribing to some mailing lists first. Figure out what people are talking about. Figure out what, what the issues are. Figure out what people need. Um, you can also start writing documentation. Nobody likes to do documentation. Yeah. Um, you probably don't either if you are a software developer, but this is a really easy way to get started. You're going to be loved. Okay. You can also do artwork and you can do UI. So this is a bit tricky because um, not all projects necessarily need this or want this, and not all projects will necessarily be convinced that you know if you're a UX expert that this is something they should implement because of course that that involves resources. So you could, if you take that upon yourself as a personal project, then you need to make sure that developer time is something that you are aware of. So if you're gonna make suggestions about how to improve things, people expect you to be the one to be able to implement them. Yeah. Um, you could do web development for a project. You could organize meetups and events. Yay. Yay. <laughs> like some people over here. Um, you could write plugins for things because that's a really easy way to get started. So for WordPress, you could write plugins, Ruby Gems. Um, uh, that makes it really easy. Uh, Node makes it really easy for you to write uh, small, small uh, snippets of code as well. Um, there's also lots of different uh, engagements like the Google Summer of Code, and I'll talk a bit about that in the end. And Firefox has mentored bugs. This is really fun. So Firefox has newbie-friendly bugs that are labeled, and it also has mentor bugs. So if you want to get started, if you want to sort of play around with things a little bit, then people have already labeled this for you. People have already said, look, this is something you can look at. This is a good starting point. This is something you can try to address. Yeah? And the mentored bugs actually have someone attached to them. There are much fewer bugs than there are newbie-friendly bugs, but there's tons of newbie-friendly bugs, so this is a really good way to get started. Of course, you can also open source your own project, whatever you're working on, and see what happens, right? So uh, what I'll leave you guys with is a couple of things that you could um, think about getting engaged in. So the Google Borg Anita Scholarship is uh, the, the Google Anita Borg Scholarship um, is available here. And I think applications are open until somewhere in May. So um, if you are still studying, if you're in the software, uh, if you're doing anything connected to computers or software, then this is something you should apply for. Uh, the Rails Girl Summer of Code has just closed the applications. Um, I don't know if there's going to be another one this year, but you should definitely try next year. Um, the Ada Initiative have camps several times a year. And um, there's also no outreach. This is not a typo. Um, so all of those women that I talked about, um, they've all come together and they've put all of those different women's outreach associations into one big project. So GNOME Outreachy is just called Outreachy, FOSS Outreachy, you can just type in any one of those, you're gonna get the right thing, okay? And you can get involved with them. Um, that's actually all I have. So if you wanna get in touch, ask me whatever you want. Thanks. We have time? You want to play a game? Yeah, let's play okay. a game. <laughs> All right, let's play a game. Um, so I want you guys to, to get up, and uh, yeah, of course it involves getting up. I mean, what do you think we're gonna do? <laughs> All right, um, stay where you are. So what you're gonna need to do is you're gonna need to work together with your side of the room. So this is this is imagine there's a wall here, and you need to figure out 
how many people on the other side of the wall have pets without talking to them? What? <laughs> have pets. <laughs> <laughs> So you, you can do anything you want, but you can't talk to the other side of the room. So the line is here. Should we get the answer? So there's no one on the other side? Yes, you can come. You can talk among yourself. So you just can't talk to the other side. Oh, okay. So what should we do? Do you have, if you have a pet, just raise your hand. <laughs> That's it? Just three of us? Three of us? Alright, so we know, we know on this side we've got three. That's not bad. So we know the answer already. The, 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 yeah. we, the game is, objective is to know what the other side is. Yeah. So we know the answer. Not optimistic. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I think we should do the same thing that everybody on this side has <laughs> raised their hand. in this <laughs> meetup <group>. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this side has three pets. What about this side? Two. 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 Okay. So um, you can sit down. <laughs> okay. So what was, the, what was the point of me getting you to do this? The point was that um, you, you, you probably noticed some of the dynamics, right? So uh, the first thing that someone said was, you know, just stick up your hands, right? So um, power of the people. Good. But that also means that you let them know how many pets you have without knowing how many pets they have, right? Which is exactly what you said. You said, well, Kayla, we win, right? Then we don't need to do anything, right? Yeah? Um, this is a problem of the comments, right? This is a problem of collaboration. This is exactly the kind of thing that we've been talking about today. But I think that you'll find in general, when you put a bunch of people together and you're trying to solve a problem, it works out a lot better than you think. That's all. All right. Thanks, guys. Any questions? So if you have questions, please feel free to raise your hand. Tell us yes. about yourself. Sorry. And afraid of is the fact that there's a lot to do, right? So how do you negotiate those things? How do you work together to build something that's really complex, even though there's so many of you and you're not really meeting together, right? Yeah. Um, 
most of the time, that problem is solved in, op in the open source software world with modularity. So breaking things down into small pieces. So um, what is the smallest thing that you can do? And then build on top of that, build on top of that. What is the most simple thing that you can do, rather than what's the most complex? So a lot of projects start out, a lot of successful projects start out as very simple things. There are some exceptions, but more often than not, like Linux, it started out as one man, a one-man project. It's something you could do by yourself, right? And then people started to add on and more and more and more. So think about how you can split this up into things that one person can do, and then that gives outputs that the other person can use in whatever they're doing, right? Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. That's actually a very small percentage. So the fact that people are paid to develop free software is sort of the exception of the rule. But more towards your question, um, I've seen a lot of folks talk about that as one of the, as one of the really big problems. Um, and I think what what it sounds like to me is it boils it boils down to how you can make the job of the maintainer easier, right? So if you can break this down into things where they can go, oh okay, right? So imagine if you're the maintainer and you are reading your path. Is it something that you can skim through on your way to work? Is it something that you can look at while you're on the bus, while you're brushing your teeth, you know, whatever? Yeah. So make it something that's really easy to digest, just like with any piece of writing. Yeah? And if you can do that, then you're more likely to get that accepted because it frees up the, the workload for that person. Because then they don't have to think, okay, what is it What is it you're trying to do? Okay, but what if it affects this? What if it affects that? If you do that mental work for them, they can just go, okay. So I mean, without knowing the details, it sounds like that's something you might want to try. Okay, any other questions? I'm sort of invading your space here. <laughs> <laughs> Some of your guys are like, oh. But um, what is? Yeah. What is with your looking your research? Oh, my related research. with the So I, I study conflict. I study conflict. Um, conflict within teams. And um, what, I, what I look at in particular is whether that's a good thing or a bad thing for the team. Because I think if you follow an mailing list, you tend to see a lot of discussions about how you know, everyone is being really mean and let's not all be so mean to each other and can we all get along and start developing some code, please. Right, that's sort of the gist. But it turns out that uh, conflict is actually uh, a little bit more constructive than that. So um, you know how I talked about transparency earlier and the fact that everyone can see what you're doing? So the fact that everyone can see what you're arguing about is also really important. Uh, the fact that you've documented this argument before, okay, sometimes it will happen again. Sometimes you can have things drag on for years, and sometimes it's a feature of the project. Sometimes there just isn't a good person to make a decision. When there's too many people who try to make a decision, it doesn't generally work out very well. But a lot of the time, if you have this documented, a lot of the time what it helps to do is it helps to flesh out issues that you didn't know were there which doesn't necessarily happen in a closed source environment because you have hierarchies, you have 
procedures, you have deadlines, you have things you need to follow. You don't have time to talk about you know, more idealistic things. You don't have time to talk about well, the what ifs. And I think that's what makes open source stronger. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Free and open source software and just open source software? Um, there isn't. So there's free software and there's open source software. So free software is uh, the movement that Richard Stallman started, and open source software is the movement that Eric Raymond started, the guy with the keyboard. So for instance, there's two web browsers, Chrome and Chrome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, as, as I uh, heard, Chromium is more open than Chrome. I yeah, mean, so Chrome is not open source software. Chromium is. Uh, Chromium is the project that, just like Android itself is not open source software, but it's built on Linux. Um, and so there's a version of Android that's open, but not the what you get in your phone is not necessarily open source software. So it's the same thing. So there's freeware. There's things that you get for free, but you don't necessarily have access to the source code, um, like Unix, in the earlier example, right? And then there's free software in the free software foundation definition, which might be a little bit confusing. So free as in uh, free as in speech, not free as in beer, which is what people often say, right? So free as in I'm allowed to give it to you, you can see what's going on with it. And open source software is literally the idea of being able to look under the hood and it doesn't have any assumptions morally or ideologically. So the difference between free software and open source software is a kind of an ideological one. So the free software guys say, this is a moral imperative. This is something that we need to do in order to sustain um, our uh, economy, in order to sustain our um, development. Whereas the open source guys are like, yeah, well, if I want to sell software, I should be able to sell software. But it's actually better if it's open source for reasons of quality, for reasons of people working together, and, and all of those reasons that we talked about. Any other questions? Do you have any thoughts about how to market an open source project? You know, like how, how to get people involved? Uh, to developers? Get them to use it. Get them to use it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> honestly. <yeah. laughs> I think the reason you're laughing is because you probably know that too. Yeah. So most people who contribute are the people who use it on a daily basis. And that's how you find problems. You get comfortable enough with the system and you go, ah, OK, wait, that doesn't work the way that I want it to. How can I fix that? Again, it's that selfish interest. So make it make sense for them. Why would they contribute their valuable time? Yeah. So the software itself is not the valuable aspect anymore. It's the time that you put in. Any last questions? No? Okay, then I think we're done. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you guys. Um, right now, I think someone actually has. Um, any oh yeah, any announcements? Um, so if you guys are organizing, like if you guys are organizing your own tech meetups, or you have a job opening at your company, you want to share with us, or what else? Um, you have announcements about? Yeah, um, three things. Um, next Tuesday is the Ruby meetup. Um, please come; it'll be really fun. Uh, <laughs> we have a bunch of talks lined up. It's going to be at the National Design Center in Bugits. Uh There's also going to be pizza. <laughs> uh, two, uh, there's a Rails Girls happening every month in Singapore, in case you, you didn't know. So if you want to get started, if you want to learn more, it's mentored. So there are actually people there to help you. Um, and that happens at the end of every month. So the next one is going to be the same week as the Ruby meetup, but on Saturday. So, right? Or is it this Saturday? I think it's next Saturday. It should be next Saturday. Okay. Anyway, they have a meetup group. You can go and check it out. And just RSVP. Okay, uh, number three, uh, Red Dot Ruby Conference is coming in June. Um, so like I said, Linda Lucas is going to be there, um, Matt is going to be there, um, Aaron Patterson is going to be there, and a bunch of other people. So if you're a Ruby people or if you're interested to learn more about Ruby, that's a really good place to start. Just search for Red Dot Ruby Conference. Yeah. yeah. Early bird tickets are still on sale. You can ask Adam for discounts. <laughs> <laughs> if you buy in bulk. <laughs> so if you want to go. And yes. Yeah, one more, please. And you have an announcement. So as, uh, as well. Uh, some of the GitHubers coming down to Singapore. We will we intend to organize a yeah. program called uh, a workshop called Patchwork that is originally uh, initiated by Jess, 
J Law, <laughs> Jessica Law, I think she's uh, one of the uh, GitHubers. Uh, so it probably won't be on a weekend, the week before or after we won't bring Bitcoin. So please watch out for it and come and join us. How Even if you are. How sorry? Do they sign up? Um, we will we will set up some meetup group and Facebook group for you to sign up. At the moment, we do not have anything yet you because we're waiting for confirmation from the GitHubers. Even if they do not come, we're still gonna go ahead and run it. If you are familiar with contributing to open source projects, please come and uh, help us. <laughs> we'll uh, share it on our Facebook others. group when he shares the link with us. So. Yeah. So just it's a patchwork. You can probably follow the Twitter account. So um, red.rubyconf has a Twitter account, and they also have a website. So you can find most of the information there. So if you Google for red.rubyconf, you should be able to stay in touch. Anyone else? Any other announcements? Yeah, OK, one more. Uh, well, we're uh, focused on startup, and we're looking for tech guy to help us. Uh, go and tech guy. Oh, no. Basically, Node.js, we're looking for Node.js developer, full stack, uh, React, to help us build our focus. What, what, sorry, what's film, discovery? Film discovery. Okay. Films, films. Okay, what, what, what it's, is it? It's, it's like Spotify or Tinder for films. It's like discovering short films and release one pages based on your It's like what, Spotify and Tinder? It's, it's like Spotify It's a hybrid between yeah. Spotify and Tinder. Okay. Yeah. That's really films. interesting. Okay. Yeah. Minimal UI, so just watch whatever. Yeah. Okay. So if you're interested for your look for the kind of <laughs> yeah. If you're interested at working in the intersection of Spotify and Tinder. <laughs> I hope you take lots of videos. Yes. Of the final product, please, for all of us. <laughs> One more. Uh, so I am representing Data Kind. Okay, if you have the Meetup website or the Meetup doc, uh, Meetup dot com uh, app, you can look for Data Kind in Singapore. Okay, as the name suggests, uh, um, we are actually a group of pro bono data scientists. Um, so this weekend is our major event, we call it Data Dive. So effectively, we are helping two organizations. One is HOME, uh, H-O-M-E, that deals with uh, migrant workers and their specific issues. The other organization that we're dealing with is Earth Hour. Okay, this year, unfortunately, because of some national events, uh, our Earth Hour didn't take place in Singapore, but for the rest of the world, uh, it still took place as planned. Okay, so what it is, is that this Friday evening, we are going to uh, have an introductory session, networking session. The main actual coding would be the whole of Saturday and whole of Sunday. Okay, now if you go to the uh, meetup.com uh, page for DataKind, it's already full house. Now there's a reason for it, because we need to cater food. But if you can take care of the food yourself, you're more than welcome. <laughs> we need more hands, we need more uh, brilliance. Okay, so, uh, and, and of course, uh, being gig girls, more ladies, because it's very imbalanced now, in bar, in bar, you know. So, um, yeah, so please do, do come and join us. It's at the Fuji Xerox building, uh, just at the edge of CBD. Okay. Um, yeah. So do consider the information are all on the meetup, but don't sign up there because it's full house already. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yes. Of so course. Yeah. So next sorry. week there is a big data as you meet up here as well. So if you're into big data stuff and they have two visiting speakers from overseas, so if you're interested in this kind of stuff, go to Facebook, search for big data on SG, and you'll see the event details, and it will be in the same place. So we will have a share about all these events on our Facebook page, so you can just like our page if you want to see more updates. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Um, we are also looking for volunteers. Um, if you can coach or start a, a workshop, um, please come and talk to me. If you want to teach and get more women in tech, uh, that's something that yeah. you know we're all here, we're all doing this. If for. you want to mentor Rails yeah. girls. Mentor Rails girls, to talk to Anna. So. So can we all give a and a big round of applause for them?
Yeah. So, until then. Yeah. So, if there are any s uh, yeah. free software developers among you, I'd love to talk to you more. For research. And for fun. And for pleasure. And for pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you guys for coming. What's the uh, mentor boxing?